Okay, we're all set. Okie dokie. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Fantastic. Okay. Good evening. My name is Laura Lindroff, and I am the Director of Programming and Community Engagement at our local nonprofit, Rainbows for All Children. My background and training is in global public health, specifically focusing on preventive health at the community level. Knowing the impact that childhood adversity, loss, and trauma can have on health, I mainly focus on developing and promoting intervention strategies that can help reduce the long-term effects. And just to be clear, I am not a mental health professional, but I do have over five years of training and certifications in grief, loss, and trauma, and over 25 years as a public health educator. I've been with Rainbows for All Children for just over five years. And we train volunteers in community-based sites all over the world to lead free support groups for children ages 3 to 18 who are grieving. Our flagship Rainbow support group is for those affected by the absence of a family member as a result of death, separation or divorce, incarceration, deportation, deployment, significant illness, abandonment, or some other life-altering traumatic event. And our silver linings groups are for those affected by a community crisis, such as the current pandemic or something like racial trauma, et cetera. Oops. My screen is not clicking to the next slide. On one second. <laughs> okay, there we go. Since 1983, Rainbows has served close to 4 million children by providing them support and helping them to develop and strengthen problem solving and coping skills, to learn stress and anger management, alleviate depression and anxiety, improve communication skills, and reduce emotional pain and suffering. Our support groups are not professional counseling or therapy, but they provide children and teens a safe, secure, and confidential space to share their feelings and see that they're not alone in their grief. Using an evidence-based curriculum, facilitators guide you through activities that help generate discussion. And while the losses that participant have ex participants have experienced may differ, the way that we provide support is the same. As children discover the unique challenges each of their peers has had to cope with, they learn empathy and compassion. The final meeting of both programs encourages group members to reach out to others who might be grieving too, as a way to not only pay it forward, but to empower themselves by supporting others and sharing what they have learned. Our tagline at Rainbows is guiding you through the storms of life, which is what we do with our support groups. We advocate for children and teens, and very often that is helping people, mainly parents, teachers, and other adults, understand how children grieve differently than we do and how we can best support them in that process, which is what I'm intending to do with you all tonight. At the end of the presentation, we will have time for me to address any questions that you might have as well. When we talk about grief and loss, there are often a lot of different words thrown around. So I'd like to spend just a few moments clarifying some of the terminology, including loss, childhood adversity, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, trauma and toxic stress. So first let's start with the simplest word, loss. Typically that word tends to conjure up death for most people, but loss simply means something or someone is no longer present, at least physically in the same way as before. In rainbows, we tend to use the phrase absence of a family member rather than loss of a loved one for two reasons. Many grief-related organizations only provide support to cope with a death loss, whereas we are able to care for many different types of losses that one might experience. We say family member rather than loved one because a person who is missing may not have been loved or there is lost love because of the absence. A child who has been abandoned by a parent, for instance, may yearn for the relationship that they wish they had had, but they don't necessarily feel love for that person anymore. 
childhood adversity is a broad term that refers to a wide range of circumstances or events that pose a serious threat to a child's physical or psychological well being. Common examples of childhood adversity include child abuse and neglect, domestic violence, bullying, serious accidents or injuries, discrimination, extreme poverty, and community violence. There is greater recognition and more widespread understanding now that experiencing adversity in childhood poses risks to both physical and psychological health and well being. Research shows that such experiences can have serious consequences, especially when they occur early in life, are chronic or, and or severe, or accumulate over time. For example, the effects of childhood adversity can become biologically embedded during sensitive periods of development and lead to lifelong physical and mental health problems. However, adversity does not predestine children to poor outcomes, and most children are able to recover when they have the right supports, particularly the consistent presence of a warm and sensitive caregiver. Adverse childhood experiences or ACEs are a subset of childhood adversities. As some of you may be aware, a groundbreaking research study was published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine in 1998 by researchers at Kaiser Permanente and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The researchers asked adults about childhood adversities in seven categories, physical, sexual, and emotional abuse, having a mother who was treated violently, living with someone who was mentally ill, living with someone who abused alcohol or drugs, and incarceration of a member of the household. They found that more than half, 52%, reported experiencing at least one of those ACEs, and 6.2% had experienced four or more by the age of 18. A current ACEs study, also funded by the CDC, includes parental divorce or separation and emotional and physical neglect. And other studies have added experiences of social disadvantage, such as economic hardship, homelessness, community violence, discrimination, and historical trauma. They were able to establish a dose-response relationship that experiencing significant adversity in childhood is directly attributable to a much greater likelihood of poor health outcomes in adulthood. In other words, researchers found that the more ACEs adults reported from their childhoods, the worse their physical and mental health outcomes were. A person with four or more ACEs is twice as likely as a person with a score of zero to develop heart disease and cancer, and three and a half times as likely to develop chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD, three of the leading causes of death in the US. Those with four or more also have a fourfold increased health risk for alcoholism, drug abuse, dep and depression, and are 12 times more likely to attempt suicide. The most common ACEs seen in the US are economic hardship, and parental separation or divorce. While we don't yet have data to support this, it is highly likely that those and other ACEs have increased significantly as a result of the current pandemic. Trauma is one possible outcome of exposure to adversity. And trauma occurs when a person perceives an event or a set of circumstances as extremely frightening, harmful, or threatening, either emotionally, physically, or both, and either to themselves or to someone that they love. With trauma, a child's experience of strong negative emotions like terror or helplessness and physiological symptoms such as rapid heartbeat, bedwetting, stomach aches, and headaches may develop soon afterward and continue well beyond their initial exposure. Certain types of childhood adversity are especially likely to cause trauma reactions in children, such as the sudden loss of a family member, a natural disaster, a serious car accident, or a school shooting. 
other childhood adversities, such as parental separation or divorce, tend to be associated with more variability in children's reactions and may or may not be experienced by the child as trauma. If we're considering the effect of exposure to adversity on a child, the important question to ask is, how is the child affected by what happened? Childhood trauma is associated with problems across multiple domains of development. However, trauma affects each child differently, depending on their individual, family, and environmental risk and protective factors. How a child reacts to a potentially traumatic event also has to do with factors like the level of support and care received from surviving family members, any prior history the child has with trauma, their own natural resiliency, their level of development, and even personality traits. For example, two children who experience the same type of adversity may respond in distinct ways. One may recover quickly without significant distress, whereas another may develop childhood traumatic stress or even post-traumatic stress syndrome, PTSS, and benefit from professional help such as the services and supports that comprise trauma-informed care. In case you haven't heard PTSS before, it is the newer term for PTSD, moving away from the more negative and often stigmatizing word disorder to the less threatening word of syndrome. Both are inter interchangeable though, you can say PTSD or PTSS. Oops. My screen is not moving again. <laughs> when children are exposed to very high levels of chronic stress or anxiety uh, or adversity or really intense or scary experiences, it actually changes the way their bodies and brains are wired. And ultimately that can lead to changes in brain development, changes in the development of the immune system, our hormonal systems, and even all the way down to our DNA. Childhood adversities, including ACEs, can overactivate the child's stress response system, wearing down the body and brain over time. When a child experiences adversity that is extreme, long-lasting, or severe, such as chronic neglect, domestic violence, or severe economic hardship, without adequate support from a caregiving adult, they can develop child traumatic stress. Continued overactivation of a child's stress response can lead to a condition known as toxic stress. And it puts these children at an increased risk of long-term behavioral and physiological disorders, such as depression, drug abuse, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, stroke, immunology, and inflammation patterns. While the fight, flight, or freeze stress response is adaptive or life-saving when we need to respond to a scary situation, it can be maladaptive or damaging to one's health if it is constantly turned on because there's something that's causing fear or a heightened state of stress most or all of the time. This is particularly harmful to a child because they're still developing. Toxic stress affects their developing systems and it negatively alters them. And because it can even alter a person's DNA, researchers studying the effects of ACEs are seeing poor health outcomes being passed on to future generations as a result of toxic stress. One example being historical trauma or racial trauma, including post-traumatic slave syndrome, which can also affect multiple generations. Over the last 30 years, Dr. Bruce Perry has been an active teacher, clinician, and researcher in children's mental health and the neurosciences, holding a variety of academic positions, including adjunct professor in the departments of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. His work on the impact of abuse, neglect, and trauma on the developing brain has impacted clinical practice, programs, and policy across the world. He explains the signs to look for in a child who has been potentially traumatized. These include re-experiencing the traumatic event, avoidance either of the reminders of the event and or of normal activities, fearfulness, 
sleep problems, nightmares, sadness, or poor academic or social functions. It's normal for a child to experience these up to about three months after a traumatic event. However, if they persist beyond that time, especially if they're still present after six months, the child most likely needs additional help from a mental health professional. One of the unique challenges with this current pandemic is that normally with community crises, you have a traumatic event occur, a hurricane, a tornado, a terrorist attack, and then it's over. People then typically move into a period of recovery and mental health is addressed. With COVID-19, it has been like the never ending trauma. There is no clear cut end to what we are experiencing and many of the losses are also growing rather than diminishing. It is therefore even more important to pay attention to signs and symptoms that a child is having difficulty coping and seek treatment when necessary. As you'll hear in this presentation, some children will simply need attention, reassurance, and support from a constant present adult in their lives. Others may need to be taught some coping techniques to lessen anxiety that they may not have had previously, or healthy ways to manage their stress. And some may need professional counseling or therapy to address deeper issues caused by the traumatic loss event particularly if they have a history of psychological issues and or have experienced multiple losses either recently or in the past. Perhaps the best antidote to adversity is resiliency, the ability to bounce back from a difficult or challenging life experience and move forward. However, many adults mistakenly believe that all children are naturally resilient and will simply recover from whatever life hands them. them. While some people, including children, do seem to have more natural resiliency to cope with adversity, not all do. Expecting that a child who does not have the brain development of an adult should simply be able to cope with any situation that life throws its way is not only unjust, but can have severe repercussions for a child. But building resilience is something that can be developed. Dr. Meg Jay is a clinical psychologist and associate professor of education at the University of Virginia. And she wrote, recently wrote a book called Supernormal, The Untold Story of Adversity and Resilience. In it, she shares stories of many of her clients who have experienced she explains how everyday superheroes triumph over traumas of every kind, analyzing why some people are able to overcome adversity while others struggle. She illustrates how traits like grit, perseverance, self-control, and other characteristics seem to help people to have greater resilience to adverse experiences. Anger, for example, an emotion common to grief, can actually be productive to the healing process if it is coupled with goal-directed forward-moving behavior. When we move from simply feeling emotions to acting purposefully on them, activity shifts to the prefrontal cortex, the area of the brain that plans and executes behavior. The right prefrontal cortex manages our more pessimistic responses. And it's activated when we feel angry and powerless. We sit and stew. However, if we can move from feeling angry to feeling angry and powerful, the question of what has been done to me instead becomes, what am I going to do about it? To benefit from the anger that we feel, we must move from being a victim to being an activist, at least on our own behalf. Dr. J goes on to say that as with other childhood adversities, the death of a parent, for example, can bring opportunities for personal growth. Eight out of 10 children who lost a mother or father say they are more resilient than other people, and 60% say they are stronger because of their loss. They are able to take something bad and turn it into something good. That's not to say they wouldn't change their circumstances if they could, 
but they learned something from the experience and gained skills and attributes they might not have had otherwise. These are some of the aspects of psychological resilience shared by psychiatrist Frederick Flack, who's been working with trauma survivors for decades. He proposes the real question should not be, why did some fall apart? But rather, why on earth didn't they all fall apart? Maybe not in the middle of the crisis, but why not afterward? Perhaps many of us can empathize with that sentiment given the last year we have all lived through. Dr. Flack observed that those who coped best with trauma were those with insight into the emotional impact of what they had just been through and who were able to express their feelings to another immediately following the event. Telling one story or narrative is an important step to the road to healing from adversity. As the Center for the Developing Child at Harvard University explains, no matter the source of hardship, the single most common factor for children who end up doing well is having the support of at least one stable and committed relationship with a parent, caregiver, or other adult. These relationships provide the personalized responsiveness, scaffolding, and protection that can buffer children from developmental disruption. Relationships also help children develop key capacities, such as the ability to plan, monitor, and regulate behavior, and adapt to changing circumstances, all of which better enable them to respond to adversity when they face it. This combination of supportive relationships, adaptive skill building, and positive experiences constitutes the foundation of resilience. Understanding how children grieve after an adverse life event is important to providing them adequate support and helping them to build resiliency. Based on what we've learned from working with grieving youth for the past 38 years, these are the four guiding principles of the Rainbows program. Adults often don't recognize when children are grieving. Grief is often misunderstood. It is a powerful and natural emotion. Yet in the midst of loss, each child's experience is unique. How a child grieves depends on the loss, the amount of love invested in what has been taken away, the relationship that was shared, and how the loss occurred. When loss occurs, children are hit by a myriad of emotions. Their minds and hearts are battered by an onslaught of strange, scary, and unpredictable feelings. They're often frightened by the intensity of their anguish and confusion. Children don't know how to grieve and the consequences of this can be devastating. Children and teens often are left with no one guiding them through the turbulent storms of grief. After a life altering traumatic event, caregivers are frequently immersed in their own pain and cannot provide adequate support for their children. Alone, many of these children and teens turn to destructive and even life-threatening behaviors as a means of coping with their overwhelming pain. Children don't distinguish between the pain of loss that results from death and the pain of loss that results from other traumatic events, such as separation or divorce, abandonment, significant illness, etc. Adults do, but children don't. Children experiencing those losses grieve just as deep, deeply as those who have had a family member die. They are not conceptual thinkers and cannot differentiate between the types of loss. They only know that something is missing. And children can heal from loss. Grieving children and teens need adult guidance and help. They can't negotiate grief's emotional abyss alone, but they can survive and thrive if they are supported and given the tools to grieve. For children, the grieving process is different. Minutes after they have been told a loved one has died or their parents have confessed their plans for divorce, for example, the child might run outside to play. It isn't because they don't feel deep sorrow, but rather they are only able to grieve for short periods. Their lack of emotional maturity simply doesn't allow them to sustain intense pain for long periods. We call those intermittent bouts of grief sad attacks. Sad attacks are spontaneous. They come without warning and cannot be prevented. 
Anything that reminds children of the loss can trigger a sad attack. A grieving child can be in the middle of playing a game, doing homework, or even watching TV when a commercial song or an image washes over them with memories of the past. If the child is working through their grief, sad attacks occur with less frequency over time, although they never cease entirely. Years later, a memory or an event can trigger a bout of sadness. Sad attacks are healthy. They allow the grieving child time to reflect on and revisit their grief. They help them assess how far they've come and also help them move forward in the work of healing. Grief is the normal and human reaction to a significant loss or change in our lives. When a loss occurs, even children too young to articulate what is missing know that something important, a voice, a touch, a regular play date with peers is no longer part of their lives. Even young babies can frequently sense when a person is missing and will often react with a change in behavior, sometimes becoming fussy or irritable or needing to be held constantly. Basically, if a child is old enough to love, they are old enough to grieve. 16-year-old Luke knew his younger brother, Matt, was seriously ill. Matt was diagnosed with leukemia six months earlier and had been hospitalized for long periods since. Their parents openly discussed the treatments that Matt had to undergo, but they never acknowledged that Matt might die. Luke thought it was just a matter of time where his brother would be healthy again and back to normal. One afternoon, Luke walked in the door after school and found his parents and sisters sitting in the living room. They looked stricken and sad. His mother burst into tears. Matt died, she blurted out. Luke didn't say a word. He ran from the room, grabbed a basketball and started shooting baskets in the driveway. When he finally ventured inside more than an hour later, his parents were angry. How could you leave? You should have been here with us, his dad said. Aren't you going to cry? Doesn't it matter to you that your brother is dead? His mom demanded. Luke shrunk away. Later, he came to his parents and admitted that he was confused by and ashamed of his own behavior. I didn't want Matt to die, he said. I never knew anyone who died. And when it happened, I didn't know how to act or what to do or how to feel. Stunned by the news, Luke desperately tried to make life seem normal. So he did what he routinely did after school, shot baskets. It was, he acknowledged to his parents, a way to deny the truth he couldn't face and to avoid the horrible, sad feelings that were washing over him. Children also grieve for reasons that are not always apparent to adults. The changes that occur after loss can be confusing and frustrating and appear chaotic to children who prefer normal routines and schedules to make life more manageable. Those changes can cause them to worry and add stress to the grief that they are already experiencing. Our culture doesn't prepare children for loss. As a result, feelings of grief are alien to our youth. Many children, especially the very young, don't even know the words to describe their emotions. Often, grief is expressed through misbehavior or physiological ailments like headaches or stomach aches. If the absence of a family member or a significant community crisis occurs and no one talks to the child about how life might change, they are left to create their own fantasies about the situation. And though some of these fantasies can seem absurd to adults, to children, they're very real and very scary. As children mature into adolescence, they learn how to express their feelings verbally and should be better equipped to cope with loss. Rarely, however, do adults talk to them about what has happened. I mean, say to me, if these feelings are a normal reaction to loss, then how come not one adult has ever talked to me about them? They talk to me about all these other things like drinking and driving or sex or being home by curfew. Grieving teens are left thinking that their feelings are weird and unacceptable. Worse, they may lose their grip on reality. 
In Florida, one 17-year-old overweight girl thought that if she starved herself, her mother, who had abandoned her, would come back. My weight problem was the only thing we ever argued about, she said. I thought if I got skinny, it would change everything and mom would return to me. Children will often blame themselves for any type of loss, even for something like a natural disaster. They are much more self-centered. Everything in their life focuses around their experience of the world. If dad was deported, it must have been because of something the child did or didn't do. While feelings of guilt may differ depending on the loss, it's frequently experienced by children and adults alike, questioning what they might have done to prevent the loss. We're feeling like perhaps they should have expressed their love more or argued less, et cetera. Our rainbows facilitators spend a good deal of time in groups talking about who's to blame and guilt, letting kids know that not cleaning up their room like mommy asked is not why she killed herself. Grief is such a small and unassuming word, and yet it collapses even the strongest adults. Perhaps this is why so many people are afraid of it and hesitant to talk to children about loss. When we think of grief, we think only of pain and suffering. And yes, those are the initial very real associations we have with loss, of course. But if we learn to look at grief as a process that moves us from one place in life to another, from one level of personal development to a higher level of existence, it becomes possible to take a positive look at grief and present that view to children. Ironically, not all troubled responses are obvious. At the other end of the spectrum are the grieving children and teens who carry on without any noticeable change in their personality or lifestyle. It's tempting to breathe a sigh of relief and say, oh, thank goodness, this kid is fine. When a child moves through a loss experience with what appears to be perfect equanimity. But sometimes those children have simply stuck their feelings deep inside. Unless they are able to acknowledge their pain to themselves or someone else, children will never fully work through their grief. It will haunt them throughout their lives. This can affect their future relationship with a partner, the way they operate at work, the way they parent their children, and more. As mentioned previously, unresolved grief or trauma can even lead to poor health outcomes and shorten life expectancy by as much as 20 years. Grieving a serious loss takes years to complete. Oddly, the first year is usually the easiest. The grieving child is numbed by their loss and family teachers tend to be the most understanding and supportive at this time. The magnitude of loss usually sets in during the second year. Just about the time that everyone assumes the child is finished grieving, they are really just beginning. It usually takes three years after the loss for the intensity of the pain to diminish enough to allow the grieving child to begin reconstructing a new life. And by the fifth year, the child or teen is usually able to experience happiness and promise once again. By not allowing children time to grieve, adults prolong the process for them. All too often, well-meaning parents, grandparents, and teachers tell grieving children to be strong for their parents, behave, or keep up those grades. Translated to a child or adolescent, this well-intentioned advice means don't talk or think about your loss. Rather than deal with their feelings or needs, grieving children bury or deny their emotions. And consequently, the grief may linger beneath the surface for years. Children's grief should never be ignored. The consequences are too great. When children and teens suppress the powerful emotions of grief, really disclaiming or ignoring them, they use an incredible amount of energy to obscure those powerful feelings. This energy is diverted away from school, sports, hobbies, jobs, and other positive opportunities in their lives. It's part of their potential and it can be lost forever. Repressed grief does not dissipate. It simmers within and sometimes it's expressed through chronic health problems. Invariably, it subtly shapes and influences the child as they grow up and become an adult. 
Submersed grief colors their outlook on life. At work or with friends, they'll tend to be cynical and treat even weighty matters like a joke. There's an edge to them. They maintain a careful calculated distance. Fear of intimacy keeps them from serious commitments and makes them wary of establishing lasting relationships. When the painful emotions of grief are disavowed or withheld, all other feelings are repressed as well. It's impossible to deny some feelings and express others. When grief is suppressed, anger is buried along with it, as are joy and love. Over time, suppressed grief invades every facet of a child life, academics, activities, relationships, emotional and physical health, and even their dreams. Since more than half our Rainbow sites are at schools, we frequently hear from teachers and other school staff what grief looks like when a child or teen is in school. Here are some of the warning signs that teachers have observed that signal a student might be experiencing turmoil at home. With remote learning, this might also look like a child never turning their camera on in class, not engaging, and or frequently expressing discontent with life, or seeming uninterested in any activities they used to find enjoyable. Most of us recognize the obvious symptoms of grief, such as crying or sadness. But what about when a grieving seven-year-old throws frequent temper tantrums? or a straight A high school student refuses to do their homework. Those responses are also signs of grieving. Although I'm surprising, most behavior changes in grieving children are normal reactions to a significant loss. Unable to express their emotions, grieving children and act them out. This can be frustrating for the adults in their lives but it can also provide insight into the child's emotions. Dramatic shifts in demeanor can indicate unresolved issues of grief and anger and should be viewed and handled in that context. Behavioral changes may appear immediately after a loss, but more often they don't surface until several months later. In some instances, it can even take years. These are some telltale signs of normal behavior changes for the different age groups. Extreme changes indicate serious problems. Not all grieving children and teens will exhibit extreme behavior changes, but all are at risk for them. These are some of the troubled responses to loss for the different age groups. And in case I didn't mention it before, I will provide a copies of this PowerPoint if anyone would like. These are some of the indicators of normal versus troubled response to loss. Although we generally use the term children to refer to all youth under 18, teens certainly deserve to be recognized as developmentally different from young children. Adolescence tends to be a complicated, difficult period. Most teens feel insecure. They fear rejection and often mask their real feelings. Many teens find it hard to believe they are accepted and worthwhile. Often they feel they are not loved. Last week, I listened to a panel of high school students who serve on the youth board of the Mental Health Association of the North Shore. When adults can best support them through COVID and other types of loss events, the teens said they like when adults check in on them to make sure they're okay. They emphasize not push too hard or constantly be monitoring their mental health, but that they do appreciate feeling like someone cares about their well being. They also said that they'd like to be listened to and feel like their emotions and what they have to say is important and valid. Presented here are some of the changes experienced during all teenage years. When a loss occurs during these teen years, the adolescent must cope with many additional burdens at an already challenging time. And for the grieving teen, life can seem almost unbearable. Although the teen is struggling to establish their own separate identity, their self-image is still strongly linked to family. If the family unit disintegrates or is substantially changed during those formative years, 
the teen is left adrift. They may reassure themselves that the loss doesn't matter because they're an adult, but in their heart, they yearn for a real family. If a significant loss occurs during adolescence, the teen is often pushed into an adult role as their parent's confidant or friend, or will feel the need to compensate for their loss the family has endured in some other way. Listed here are some of the primary things that are important to note about grief. Grief rises from the heart. Children cannot wish away the emotions that result from it. Grief Hands understanding, guidance, and time. Grief acknowledges and honors the love of someone or something that is now absent from their lives. Grief's pain is deep. It is unlike any other suffering that we endure, and it carries its own agony. When we help children deal with grief in appropriate and life giving ways, we teach them to be resilient. We provide them with invaluable lessons for life and prepare them for other life-challenging losses they will inevitably encounter in future years. Children and teens who learn how to grieve will not be overwhelmed by the pain of loss that strikes later in life in order to move through the process of grief. Dr. Bruce Perry also suggests specific interventions that should be considered with children who have experienced traumatic loss. Talk about the traumatic event. Help them tell their narrative. If they have trouble speaking it out loud, they can write a, a letter addressed to the loss or to the missing person or journal about their feelings. We recently did this activity as a family writing dear COVID letters and then shared them with each other. There were some parts that made us cry, but also many parts that made us laugh. And ultimately we found that just as with most traumatic experiences, this pandemic hasn't been all bad. We did manage to find some silver linings. Be sure the child understands what happened accurately. This is also why it's important for them to tell their story because misinformation may come out. I heard mom say that my sister has a lot of seizures because something's wrong with her brain. I remember hitting her on the head when we were little. Maybe this is my fault, especially with similarly important. Dr. Perry warns keeping secrets about the event can be very destructive. It's okay to tell children when you don't know why things happened. Even adults don't have all the answers sometimes, especially to the question, why did this happen? Consider timing and language. You don't want to go into depth about what occurred immediately after when a child is still in shock. This is true with any trauma survivor, and it's a crucial component taught in psychological first aid. They will not be able to comprehend what you are saying. Language, too, should be age appropriate. Advocate for the child. Inform others in the child's world what's happened with permission or encourage caregivers to do so. Be sure they understand that there isn't a time limit on grief or getting over a major adversity. Also protect the child, pay attention to signs of PTSS or PTSD and other behaviors and back off on activities that appear to worsen their grief. Be observant, patient, tolerant, and sympathetic. They've been terrified and hurt. Find out if school performance has suffered. Watch for changes in patterns of play and loss of interest in activities. It may take time, but if a child sees that you are trustworthy and caring, it is more likely that they will come to you for help. Be nurturing and caring to an extent. If there is history of abuse, proceed with caution. Even something as innocent as give me a hug can be traumatizing for an abused child. They take orders very seriously. Even if the hug will make them uncomfortable, they will feel they have to do it. And children with chronic trauma can often have attachment issues, making it very difficult for them to receive affection. Also, as I mentioned from the teen panel, adolescents like us checking in on them, but not too often. Remember, it's more important to listen than to try and fix their situation. Offer choice and help them gain control. 
providing as much routine as possible, giving them choices and encouraging decision-making will help them get some sense of control of their world that has just been turned completely upside down. It can be frightening for a child to see adults in class disorganized, confused, or anxious. They need a sense of calmness and order. You can help them understand the reactions of loved ones are normal and they will pass. Be consistent with rules and enforcing them. This also helps establish order for them. Set boundaries, use positive reinforcements and rewards. And finally, practice mindfulness activities. Help close their eyes and gaze softly downward. Pay attention to the sounds around them, any smells, what they might feel on the floor or chair. Drawing their attention to the outside external factors can help take the focus off any intense feelings that they might be experiencing. Phew, now breathe. We made it to the end. Thank you all for hanging in there with me and I hope you found at least some of what I said to be of value. I wanna end this presentation with an important takeaway. Toxic stress can be prevented. Grief is a process from which children can heal. Adversity in childhood doesn't have to lead to poor health outcomes if support is provided and the trauma is addressed. But it requires a holistic approach to physical and mental health that includes good nutrition, exercise, healthy relationships, mindfulness, and stress relief. I'm also going to type into the chat a link to a Google folder with some mindfulness, breathing exercises, and coping techniques that we've found to be useful with children and teens, and some additional resources and information. You're welcome to share these documents with anyone you'd like. And also in that folder is a flyer for a special art exhibit that will be coming up in Evanston in April and May as part of the Yay Festival. Children aged 12 to 24 are welcome to contribute any visual art or performing art piece depicting what trauma means to them. And those will be on display in person at Open Studio on Sherman at Main Street, as well as virtually during the months of April and May. And we welcome you to attend the event as well. Thank you again for listening to me. I'll now, we'll now stop the recording and you open this up for questions and you're welcome to post your questions